Section 45 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 42. The Mexican Hairless Dog by Elroy Foote. But little is known as to the origin of this breed or as to its history since that period and the literature of the subject seems to be comprised in the following few references. G. R. Jesse, in his Researches into the History of the British Dog, referring to the dogs of Buenos Aires, says, There are also small dogs without hair, except on the head and tail, which are shagged. They are often companions of the ladies of the country. In his work on The Dog, Ewatt calls attention to the vast difference between dogs of the same general type, as illustrated by the members of the Greyhound family, by the Highland, English, and Italian Greyhound, and the small hairless one of Africa or Brazil. Again, in the same work we read that the Turkish Greyhound is a small hairless dog with only a few hairs on his tail, never used in the field and bred only as a spoiled pet. Stonehenge quotes almost verbally from Ewatt on the same subject. Vero Shaw, in his fine work, The Book of the Dog, in the chapter on the Rampur Dog, says, This dog, we believe, made his first appearance in England on the return of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales from his Indian tour. At all events, we have no recollection of having seen any specimens of the Rampur Hound at dog shows, except at the Fakenham Dog Show of 1876. Only two appeared. One was of a mouse color, the other spotted, a sort of pink and blue, somewhat similar to young plum pudding colored pigs. In appearance, the Rampur dog somewhat resembles a small deer hound, but his chief characteristic is the absence of hair which leaves his body smooth. We have, however, been informed that since they have been in this country, a little hair has appeared on these dogs. Shaw also quotes Mr. W. K. Taunton, describing the Chinese crested dog, so-called from having a crest of hair running along the top of the head from front to back. In addition to this, the dog has a tuft of hair at the end of his tail but otherwise, with the exception of a few scattering hairs around the head and muzzle, and just above the feet, the dog is perfectly hairless, the skin being more or less mottled in some specimens. There is another hairless dog said to come from China, considerably smaller than the breed mentioned above, and weighing eight or ten pounds, and without any hair at all. The head is like the apple-headed toy terrier, with large bat ears standing out from the head, a very fine tail, and the skin of a uniform dark color. Here we have several different names for apparently the same kind of dog, although referred to as being native in Africa, Brazil, Buenos Aires, Turkey, India, and China, and being, as we know, also found in Mexico and Southern California. I believe they will be met in all warm climates. Whether these various strains of hairless dogs found in various hot climates are of a common origin, whether they have been distributed from some one country to the others, or whether they are the result of the so-called law of evolution, we can only conjecture. Whether in some quarter of the globe a breed of dogs has always existed, none of which ever had hair, because they did not need it, or whether they were once clothed with hair which gradually disappeared because they did not need it, who can say? If a strain of pugs or fox terriers were colonized in Central Africa and bred there for twenty-five, fifty, or a hundred years, would their hair gradually disappear? Such a supposition seems scarcely plausible, since the wild dogs of India, many of whom who live almost under the equator, are thickly coated with hair, as are nearly all other quadrupeds in hot countries. Why, then, should one breed of small dogs exist in so many parts of the world entirely, or nearly hairless? Will some Darwin, some Tyndall, some Huxley kindly investigate and give us the why and the wherefore? 
whether hairless dogs are crested or plain hairless, of uniform mouse color or plum pudding color, as our English writer picturesquely styles them, or whether they have slate or pink points, as I once saw described, it seems reasonable to suppose them all of the same breed and of the same origin, inasmuch as the smooth and the rough-coated fox terrier are of the same breed. Which is the truer type I am not prepared to say, but I will unhesitatingly state my preference for the dark, smooth, and strictly hairless dog, as against the mottled and unfinished effect of the so-called crested dog. That the former is the much rarer style I know to my sorrow, for in breeding from as good hairless stock as could be found, three out of four puppies would exhibit the unsightly pink points, and half of the litter would be blessed by nature with a slight covering for the head and tail. In Mexico, among the natives, these dogs are used externally for the treatment of rheumatism, and internally sometimes to assuage the pangs of hunger. There would necessarily be more virtue in their warm little bodies as a substitute for hot water bags than as an article of diet, at least judging from our civilized standpoint. The hairless dog is a pet and house dog only, and as such has some good qualities that his hairy brethren have not. He is naturally cleanly a peculiarity not possessed by any other native Mexican, never leaves hair about on furniture or clothes, does not have fleas or any odor other than that of the soap with which one can keep his skin as sweet and pleasant to the touch as one's own. Like any other good house dog, he is naturally watchful and suspicious of strange footsteps, and he is strongly affectionate. There is an erroneous idea prevalent that these hairless dogs have to be kept blanketed in all but torrid weather. They do not require any more artificial warmth than the Italian Greyhound, but like them should always be blanketed when exposed to outdoor winds or wintry air, but never in the house. Much covering or coddling has a peculiar effect on the color of their skin, bleaching it more or less according to the warmth and duration of the extra protection. Puppies at birth are much lighter in hue than when older, many of the white spots becoming, by degrees, smaller and beautifully less, and some entirely disappearing. In several litters out of the dogs referred to, three or four puppies only have been born dark all over. It is essential to success in breeding in the north that the puppies should not be whelped in the winter. The early springtime is best when it can be so arranged as they are then pretty well grown and established in health and vigor before the advent of the cold months. Distemper is apt to be a serious matter with them, but I have never seen one afflicted with any kind of skin disease unless I accept one poor little bitch that was suffering from an eruption, the natural consequence of a diet of sweets and indigestible pastry. The dog illustrated, Me Too, is pretty well known in the East, and the portrait is a good one. As can be seen, he is of neither terrier nor greyhound shape. By the way, nearly all writers who have treated of this dog speak of him as a greyhound and not as a terrier. Me Too is broad-chested and of such muscular development as is rarely met with in specimens of this breed. The hind quarters are extremely graceful and greyhound-like in form and action. About the time the photograph was taken from which this engraving was made, Me Too ran 100 yards on an athletics club's grounds in a fraction over seven seconds, without any training or understanding of what was expected of him. This was a trifle longer than the best on record for dogs up to that date, and this without turning a hair, if I may be allowed the expression. His tail is short, fine, and well set on, the back short and ribs well set on. The lines of the neck are so rounded as to have called forth the remark that it was like the neck of a lovely woman. His head is too short for a greyhound or terrier, but as a compensation he has a larger brain pan than either, and the soft brown eyes are full of expression. Muzzle nicely pointed, ears fine and perfectly erect but not too large for the proportions. Skin all over, soft as undressed kid, almost black in summer, and a mouse color in winter. His teeth are bad, and this is a peculiarity of the breed, being few in number and indifferent in quality. 
Yoat, in his book, mentions this singular circumstance connected with the Turkish hairless dog, and I myself observed it. It may be safely inferred that a hairless dog with good teeth gets them as a result of a cross with some outsider. Me Too weighs 18 pounds. His measurements I have never taken, and he is so old now that it would not be fair to offer them. His serious faults are two white toes on the fore and hind feet on the right side, and a jaw slightly overshot or pig-jawed, as it is termed. He was shown during five years at fifteen large bench shows and judged by ten different judges without defeat, an unusual record. Mr. W. K. Taunton, an Englishman who has had larger experience of foreign dogs than any man living, judged the Mexican hairless class at New York in 1888 and volunteered the remark that me too was a rare one, and that he had never seen his better. Mr. J. R. Pearson, formerly of Greyhound fame, has seen many of these dogs in Brazil, and has always considered me too a typical specimen. His breeding is entirely unknown to me, but I believe him to have been born about March 1882, as he came into my possession when undoubtedly a year old. Me too is now aging fast, for this climate is not conducive to longevity in the Mexican hairless race. Nellie, now in possession of Mrs. E. C. Moore of New Rochelle, New York, is also of unknown pedigree, but in her prime was a fine one. She stands badly on her feet, but that is also unnatural to her. In color, she is even darker than me too, and her skin is of remarkable softness. A few white blotches are scattered over her legs and feet, her face would be prettier if her eyes were not quite so prominent. As is proper in her sex, she is much less muscular than me too, stands a trifle higher on her legs, and is yet smaller, weighing about 14 pounds. Her action is much like that of the Italian greyhound, and she is a pretty companion for a walk. Piccaninny was the result of breeding me too to Nellie, and she was the prettiest little bitch I ever saw. She lived to the age of 11 months and then died in the agonies of strychnine poisoning. White Wings is a very good bitch out of Me Too and Nellie, having, however, much white on all four legs to which she owes her name. White Wings has been a bench show winner, but will never be able to compete again owing to blindness of one eye. I have heard of many fine Mexican hairless dogs, but actually have seen outside of my own stock only the few I mention below. Mead belonged to a Mr. Palmer of Passaic Falls, New Jersey. She was an all dark one and very good, but died when about six years old without ever having been bred. She had, however, done some winning. I saw on the street in New York a little beauty and took the trouble to find out her home. She was run over and killed soon after, and the specimen her owner replaced her with was a poor one. I have seen only two good dogs. One was a puppy of Nellie's named Judge, who died of distemper after taking a prize at his first show, New Haven, 1885. He was only half Mexican, however, having been sired by an Italian greyhound. Pippo, owned by Mrs. L. D. Hurd of New York and winner at the 1890 show there, is a good dog, of heavier frame and holding his age much better. This completes the list of good ones that I have a personal knowledge of. Pedigrees are scarce, for the breed has never been cultivated and cared for as is necessary to establish them. Dogs of this breed should be washed occasionally with Castile soap, and a liberal application of Vaseline once a month well rubbed in will improve the appearance of the skin. Puppies, while very young, should be kept in a warm room and should be handled with great care as they are extremely delicate and may be easily injured. Their bed should be made of canton flannel and should be frequently washed. The Mexican, like all other dogs that are kept mainly in the house, should have plenty of exercise. It is well to teach any house dog to retrieve a ball, and someone should put in 20 to 30 minutes each day throwing the ball in the hall or adjoining rooms and having the dog bring it. Make him move as rapidly as possible. A lively run is best. Nearly all house dogs enjoy this sport when once taught it and will enter into it with great zest. 
On every fair day, the dog should be given a run of at least half a mile in the street or in the country. The prejudice which exists in the minds of many against the hairless dog soon wears off if given the opportunity, for a better house pet with fewer disadvantages can seldom be found than a symmetrically formed, dark-colored, clean-skinned Mexican hairless dog. No standard or points of judging this breed have yet been adopted. End of section 45. Recording by Tom Mack.